to have fun, to worship the Lord, but we come to hear from the Lord. And today I believe that the Lord has something special that he wants to speak to us collectively, as a, as a body, as a family, but also to you individually. You know, that's the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit. He can take something that he speaks to everyone and make it personal to you and speak directly to you. And that is, that is our prayer today, that the, the Lord God himself would communicate and talk to you in such a way that you would know that it was him. No one else may know that it was him, but you know. And that's what I pray today. So let's just pray right now. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that you're already in this place, Lord God. What a joy it is to be in your presence, Lord. We love you so much, and we're so grateful for everything that you've given us. We're so grateful, Lord God, for, for everything that you do for us on a daily basis, Lord God. We, we are so overwhelmed by how good you are. And Father, we come here today to meet you and to hear from you. So Lord, we're just asking that you would speak to us in the way that we, we need to hear right now. There are those of us who are broken, those of us who, who just have a praise in our heart, those of us who have questions that need answers, Lord God. And I'm just asking that you would, you would teach us today and give us those things that we need individually and as a family, Lord God. Lead us and guide us. Lord, let every word that comes out of my mouth be directed by you. Let nothing come out of my mouth that is of my own accord, Lord. We just want to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, we've been going through the book uh, of Genesis, but this week, God doesn't always do this to me, but sometimes he does because he knows I like my sleep. But sometimes he'll wake me up and there's just no going back to bed. And sometimes he just won't let me go to sleep. And that happened to me this week. And anytime that happens, I believe that it's, it's something important that he wants to share with his people. You know, the Lord is doing a great thing on the earth today. He's always doing a great thing. But the greatest thing that he's doing is, is getting a deeper communication with his people and taking us to a new level. Just like we're, we have our children and we watch them grow up, the Lord is watching us grow up individually, but also his, his people as, uh, as a whole. And he's been watching us grow up throughout time. It's not just ju this generation, but each generation builds upon the next, and we mature and grow, and we grow closer to him. So we anticipate that our children that we are raising up today, they will go further and farther and be, be more in tune with God than, than I ever was. And if I've done that, then I've done a good job as a father, that they know the Lord. So God is watching and anticipating his children growing. And there's some things that we need to do in order to mature. And he's, he, he spoke to me about one of those things this week, and I want to share that with you. But before we get into it, I want to ask you guys... Uh, a question. And you know what? Where's, uh, where's Pastor Trey? He, he might be overseeing something right now. That's all right. Ryan, let me borrow you real quick. Dow, can we, oh, where's the, uh, where's the cordless? Here we go. I'm going to take, take Bob. Oh, oh, wait. Actually, if you can come down right here. Oh, down? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. How <laughs> <I> bad? <laughs> <laughs> no. You can, it, you're going to be, you're going to be the mic to the people. And this is what I want to know. But what is a pastor? When you think of a pastor, what is it that you believe that role entails? Go ahead. And you can just go to them, Ryan, as you see their hands go up. There's a domino. And real quick answers, because, you know. Teach, pastor, teach, shepherd. shepherd them. Teach them. Good. What else? Gather and protect the flock. Gather and Guide, leader. Wish we had two mics. You're going to have to move fast, Ryan. A leader. A leader. <laughs> Getting his workout on. Go ahead, Ryan, run. Pointing us to God. Pointing us to God. Oh. <laughs> Cole. A father. A pattern of Jesus. A pattern of Jesus. Nate. You know what? Nate doesn't need a mic. Go ahead, Nate. Say it. A visionary from God. A visionary from God. Making himself available to the flock. Available to the flock. Mario. He's the under shepherd to the shepherd. The under shepherd to the shepherd. Amen. There's some reason I'm hearing the a mouthpiece. Amen. Let's take, let's take two more. Or maybe five. <laughs> if you're going to run that far, we've got to get some more. Inspire us to, to learn more. Inspire to learn more. Anybody on this side? Get all the way over there. Woo! 
John. A good steward. A good steward. Protector. Protector. Overseer. An overseer. Last one, Samantha. A man who has humbled himself before the Lord. Someone who's humbled himself before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, man. Yep. Yeah, let's give Ryan a hand for doing all that running. In boots and jeans, no doubt. Boots and jeans. I wasn't going to mention the skinny jeans. I'm just playing with you. All the youth keep trying to get me to, you know, I, I used to wear baggy jeans and they're now slim and they're trying to get me to go skinny jeans. Mm -mm. <laughs> I've drawn my line in the sand. Because for me and my house, we go no further than slim. <laughs> Turn, if you will, to uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 4. What I want to speak to you all about today is proper positioning of leadership in your heart. Proper positioning of leadership in your heart. As we went around the room and I asked you, what is the role of a pastor? You all described it perfectly according to what the scripture describes it as. But there's, there's a dangerous trend that is happening within Christianity that I want to expose today and bring remedy to, at least in this family. So, Ephesians chapter 4. And let's, let's see. Oh, I was like, wait a minute, how could I be that far off? I'm in Galatians, my bad. I was like, wow, I'm lost already. Goodness. Amen. Thank you. Follow me straight to Galatians, <laughs> even though I said Ephesians. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, and let's begin at verse 7. Oh, wait, hold on. Lord, I just rebuke confusion. Get out of this place right now. Ephesians chapter 4. I told you right, but I myself went to the wrong place, see? Y'all better be careful who you're following. <laughs> see, there's a lesson even in that. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. We'll talk about that saying also. So Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 7 it says, but to each one of us, that means each of us, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also one of uh, the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. Verse 11, and he himself, he meaning Jesus Christ, gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is the role of a pastor? A pastor's responsibility and job is to shepherd over the people of God and to lead them, to feed them the word of God, to protect them. Mario said, an under-shepherd, pointing them to Christ. You guys walked in from the, from the parking lot today and on your way in, we put signs out there to guide you to the place where we were all coming to fellowship. We had them stationed at different places so you didn't get lost along the way and pointing to the right direction. This is what a pastor, any teacher or leader is supposed to do. We point in the direction of God. I was a uh, I had Ryan, who was running around the room a little while ago. We were in the car this morning together. And I don't even remember the context of what it was shared under, but uh, you guys remember that movie, Enter the Dragon? Anybody seen it? Raise your hand if you ever saw that movie. All the guys are like, yeah. All the women are like, Enter the Dragon. Ooh, that's, that sounds demonic. Oh. Yeah, Bruce, Lee. 
people say, Ariella, come on, Ariella, that's right, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was in this movie called Enter the Dragon. And, you know, one, many wonderful quotes came from that movie that we still use in my family to this day. But one of the, in one scene in the movie, you know, he's, he's uh, teaching these students, and they're fighting and everything. And, of course, you know, it's Bruce Lee, so he's whooping up on them and everything. And uh, he comes out, and he, teaches, he, take, he has a teaching moment with one of his students. And he says, it's like a finger pointing away to the moon. And his student is sitting there staring at his finger. And he goes, smacks him in the back of the head and goes, don't look at the finger, otherwise you will miss all the heavenly glory. And I said, secular, yet so profound. As a people, we have begun looking at the pointer and taking our eyes off of all the heavenly glory that God has available. We have mispositioned our leaders. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even like sitting up on this stage. The only reason I do it is for people in the back that need to see. I don't want to be up here. I don't want to put any image of me being above you because I am absolutely not. And though we may know that intellectually, our natural self tends to do that with people. If you think I'm wrong, just take a look at celebrities. They can make millions and millions and millions of dollars. You look at athletes, and we all, we all get in a, a, a tiff when they, when they go on strike because they want more money. You're like, brother, you're making $24 million a year. You make 24 times more than any person on this earth will ever make in their lifetime, and you're saying, I'm not going to play. You get paid to play basketball? I, I would do that for fun if I had time. But you get to play basketball, and you don't even have to do it all year round. You just, you just do it nine months Maybe you make the playoffs, maybe you, maybe you don't, and you get paid millions of dollars to do that, and you're going to whine and complain about not getting enough money? Shame on you. But you know what? They wouldn't have all that money if we weren't giving it to them. It is the people who decide the position. You can have someone thinking they're all that all they want, but unless a bunch of people believe that, it won't happen. It is the, it is the responsibility of the people to understand the proper positioning of their leaders. And I say this because, and, and I'm just being open and, and transparent, there, uh, there are those who I feel kind of give me that position, and it makes me uncomfortable. And, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate encouragement. You know, this is, this is not easy, uh, the, the calling that God has, has given those who are, who are to teach. He says, let, let not many of you do that, because we face a stricter judgment. So it is, it is difficult. So I do appreciate in, encouragement. It does lift my spirits because it, it can get heavy at times. But I want to make sure that everybody keeps me and any other leader within the body of Christ in their proper position. We are not to be worshipped. We are not to be looked to as if we possess all the answers. We are not celebrities. And that needs to be uh, purged out of the body of Christ. We do that too much. We do that too much. But why do we do that? Why, why do we put people in this position? Turn to, turn, turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. And we'll start with chapter 8. We'll start at verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abiha. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Quick little side note here. Remember, and this is something that I have to be held accountable to, and it's, it's something that's difficult, but as leaders, leadership, we have to do this, and I expect all of you to hold me accountable to it. My first ministry has to be my family. It has to be. Amen. It is, it, 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 there are a lot of demands in the ministry, but we see a pattern of this throughout the Bible where the leaders did not tend to their family 
And though they themselves did well, the generation coming after them failed. David, great king, great leader, but his sons did not do well. He didn't focus enough attention on them. Samuel, prophet of God, dedicated at birth, heard from the Lord. The Bible says that not one word that he spoke did the Lord let drop to the ground, yet his sons strayed from the path. He was too busy doing ministry to attend to his family. So my request of you all is that it, it, my heart is that I want to be everything to everyone. I love everybody, and I'm the type that I will do everything for anyone at the drop of a hat. And it's, it's difficult for me to say no. So my only request of you all is ask whatever you want. But, but if, I, if I have to say no, just, say, just understand that it's because I'm trying to guard my family in my first ministry. Amen. Because I can get pulled in so many different directions, and it's difficult. So, so if, I, if I say, no, I can't, then just know I love you and I wish I could, but the Lord will provide a way. You don't have to look to me. That's the great thing. Don't look at the finger pointing away to the moon. We don't, we don't stop at the signs out there and worship out there. We come into his presence and we worship. So, so don't stop at me or any leader. Wherever the Lord leads you in any church that you go to, make sure that you hold that leadership in the proper place. So that is just my, that is my request. Verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Make us a king. Israel had no king up until this point. The Lord used his prophets and his judges to, to oversee his people, and he was king over them. The people would come to the prophets and to the judges to hear the command of God and then execute commands. So what they were saying now is, look, that's not good enough for us. Look at all the other nations. Look at how they operate. They get a king in front of them. They get someone who looks great, is dressed finely, has great possessions. Someone that they can look at and say, I want everything that they have. Someone that they can parade around in front of themselves and see, look at who we follow. They wanted a king. They said, it is not enough for us just to know the command of God. We need to have a physical banner that we can watch and wave around in front of us with pride. They needed to see a king. This is the same reason Christ was rejected. Jesus didn't come to this place riding on a chair in a chariot, fine horses. He came into Jerusalem on a key. The Bible says he was nothing even to look at. You ever wonder why Judas had to betray him? Why didn't he just say, yeah, Jesus is in the garden. They go, they look at him, and there he was. Because he looked just like everybody else. There was nothing special about him. There was nothing special about that man. You could have walked by him except for the presence that you felt come off of him. You would have thought nothing. And they rejected him because they were expecting a king to come in and lord over them and lord over the Romans, destroy everybody. But they couldn't recognize love when it came in front of them. They couldn't recognize it. They said, give us a king. Give us a king that we can follow. Give me something that looks good. That's what I want. Give me a celebrity. Give me someone that looks the right part that I can point everyone to and say, yeah, I'm proud of what this is. Look at what the Lord says. Verse 6, but this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people. Remember, God, God listens to the voice of his people. He said, go ahead, heed their voice, do what they say. And all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me. They hurt the Lord's heart. Remember, when we make mistakes and we sin, it's not, be, it's not we broke a rule, we broke a heart. We broke God's heart. And that's something I don't want to do. I can break rules all day long as long as I can get away from them and get away with it, I mean. But when you break someone's heart, that, and you love them, it doesn't sit right with you. They broke God's heart. He said, go ahead, give them what they want. Give them a man to glorify. 
and to parade, and we'll see what happens. It says, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. He says, you can have a man who will reign over you. But no man is able to handle the glory that that would bring. No man can have that glory. It always corrupts. That's what it does. It, it, it brings corruption, pride. But it's hardly their fault. The people are giving it to them. The people. It was the people that made the request. So he goes on to, to warn of how the king would lord over them, would take their possessions and make them his own. Take their, 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 their sons and their daughters and make them servants in his house. Everything was going to go to him and he would lord over them. He warned them. He told them. But they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get all that. But give us our king anyway. So long as we have something visually stimulating and beautiful to look at that we can cheer on, that's all we want. I don't care if we get lorded over. It doesn't bother me. Just give me something pretty to look at. It's time for us to get past this. We take pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, prophets, and we put them in the place of God and then wonder why things go wrong. We cannot do that as a people. God and God alone deserves our glory and worship. He and He alone. You know, when you get saved, you, you know, a lot of people uh, hesitate to come to Christianity because they feel like, oh, well, this is going to be a boring life. So then what we do is sometimes with, with, within the family of God is we will try to come as close to what the world offers so that it makes it a smooth transition. You know what? They love concerts. And listen, I have nothing against concerts and Christian concerts. So I just want you to know that right now. I think they're amazing, and we, we're going to do some because it's fun, and God, God loves to have fun. However, it's kind of like I don't let my children eat dessert before they have dinner. You know why? Because they won't want the substance of dinner. They'll get filled up so they think on the sweetness and reject the substance. So let's have dinner first, then we can have some sweet stuff, so long as everything is right in its right place. But what we've done is we have sacrificed the substance of who God is and the purity of just coming into his presence and hearing his word for grandeur and celebrity and beauty. It makes me wonder, would the church today recognize the Lord if he walked in? Or would we be looking just as the people then did? for a spectacular, wonderful, visual presentation. Where are our hearts? Where are our hearts? God must have his proper place. We cannot afford as a body be looking to man. Don't look to me. I am nothing but a sign saying this way. I am a teacher of his word so that you can go this way. I am someone who has a call just like you to lead people to him. I am to be held accountable to you. There is an order in that. There are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And in that order, God demonstrates order in his family. Apostles are those who go into a new place and they prepare it spiritually and they, those are people who have to have a toughness. The apostle Paul, he was tough. You read through his epistles, he was a tough one. 
He had to go into places and get stoned and get beaten to death, get raised from the dead, and then go right back in. That was a tough guy. Little side note, we got to stop being so pansy as Christians. We are some, we've gotten to be some pansy people. You know, I mean like, oh, everything is love. Oh, just love. As long as there's flowers and everything's sweet and nice and oh, let it flow, let it flow. Oh, don't worry about that over there. That's nothing over there. Just to let it flow. All is love. <laughs> Grow up. We got to start calling each other on stuff and toughen up a little bit. But look, if, if I slip up, you all come right up to me. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's some people that teach some stuff. No you, res- no, you respect your leaders. And you don't say anything to them. You let God take care of it. <laughs> Show me that in the Word. You don't see that anywhere in the Word. We got to start teaching the Bible. If I do something, call me on it. You know, I, I, I'm gonna, I, I'll tell you something. I, had a, uh, I don't like wearing jewelry. It is annoying to me. I don't like wearing watches, uh, bracelets, anything. You're like, could have fooled me. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like wearing, wearing rings. So I, I had a wedding. I, I wore my wedding ring all the time. I lost five wedding rings. You're like, shame on you. Blasphemy. I can't believe you. <laughs> Hear me out. I, 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 for some, I cannot function with, I, I don't know, I don't know, it's a quirk, it's just how I am. So I, I'm always taking, the second I get home, I take everything out of my pocket, I take everything off of me, I'm like, oh, for some reason I just feel weighted down. So I lost five wedding rings. I put it down to do the dishes, and it's, it, it's gone. I put it down to go work out, uh, it, now, not at the gym where all the ladies are and everything, I'm like, put it in my pocket, no. <laughs> my gym is at my house, I built it there on purpose so I don't go to those places. So... So it gets lost. You know, you put it down. I got, I got little children around. It gets tossed around. I was like, you know what? Gosh. I was like, and uh, I talked to my wife. I was like, maybe I'll just get it tattooed on there. But I'm not a tattoo. I'm not, I'm not getting a tattoo. You know, the Lord said in the Old Testament, I'm just going to, that's how I am. So I'm, I'm not getting a tattoo. So I just stopped wearing a ring. And people were like, shame on you. Well, guess what? I, I don't have a biblical obligation to wear one. It was actually an Egyptian pagan ritual that had to do with ownership, and men didn't actually wear them until the 1920s. So, just in terms of tradition. So I just want you to know that I'm not rejecting God or anything that he said, but in today's culture, if someone doesn't have that on, they automatically think that you're disrespecting your marriage and everything. And, you know, I didn't wear it for the very, uh, a long time. Nobody ever said anything to me, so I was just like, oh, okay, cool. You know, if you know me for two minutes, you know my wife, you know how many children I have, and I talk about them all the time, and you know I love them with all my heart. And that's just who I am. Plus, I don't think I give off a vibe like I'm flirty or anything like that. That's just not who I am. If someone was trying to be like that with me, I probably wouldn't even know. I'd just be like, wow, she was nice. <laughs> and waddle off. So that's just, that's just not me and who I am. However, I had, I had a sister in the Lord come to me and say, you know what? I've heard a couple people wonder why you don't wear a wedding ring. And I explained it to her. She's like, it might be a good idea to wear one just so people don't stumble. I was like, you know what, I'm going to take that to the Lord and pray. And I talked to my wife about it, and I was real resistant. I'm like, I don't want to be representing some pagan thing, you know, and plus I don't like wearing rings. But you know what? For the sake of making sure that no one stumbled and that I can live a life above reproach like the Lord said, I put a ring on, and I'm going to make sure I have it on for that reason. Now, if, if no one would have come up and said anything to me, I wouldn't have known that it was bothering people, and I wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. I don't want to make anybody stumble. I could sit there and argue my rights and everything, but sometimes what we do as leaders is lay down our rights for the good of those around us. Amen. So we have to have accountability. And, and I expect people to come up and approach me with things. And I hope that you all feel comfortable doing that. If there's ever something that I say that is bothered or you're like, you know what, that doesn't line up with scripture or anything like that, feel free to come to me. If you don't feel comfortable, that's why we have uh, elders here. The elders help keep me accountable and, and, and check in with me and make sure that I'm doing the right thing. I'll ask them, did I say anything that dishonored God? Did I do anything that went against the scriptures or anything like that? And they have full reign to say, yes, you did. We need to correct this. And I'll say, yes. Okay, so long as it lines up with the word, let's do it. So there, there must be accountability, but there's accountability to the people as well. What has happened is because we put people in place of kingship, then we take on a king's mentality. And you, they begin to lord over people. Do this. Do that. Take care of this. Serve me. A king is one who is served. There is one king. 
and that is the Lord Jesus. And it's him and him alone that we serve. No one else. No one else. And we don't dare let any leader do that. If I ever come to that place, you let me know. I follow Christ and his example. What did Jesus do? John chapter 13, at the Last Supper. He came in and he took off his garment and put on the garment of a servant. And he got down and he washed his disciples' feet. And Peter said, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said what to him? He said, if you don't let me do this for you, you can have no part with me. And Peter said, then not just my, my feet, but my hands and my head. Then after supper, after Judas had left, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. To love others as I have loved you. What was that love he was talking about? A lot of times we, we think, well, he was talking about, uh, you know, dying for people, laying down your life. Well, guess what? He hadn't died yet. At that point, he had not died. Right. What was he saying? He was making reference to what he did earlier. The way I served you, the way I took off my position and got down on my knees and washed your feet, which was a dis honorable position. They had servants in the house whose job it was to wash the feet of the people. And it was not a desired position. I mean, remember, people didn't come in wearing Nikes. I mean, they had sandals. And they were walking around in dirt on the same roads that donkeys and horses are walking on. Hello, how you doing? So they're stepping in stuff. And you had to have someone there with a towel and wipe everybody's feet and get all that junk off. And then you could go into the house. And Jesus took that position. He said, the way I've loved you, the way I've served you, this, my apostles, my apostles who I'm calling to start my church around the world, this is how you love people, that you serve them. Remember the dispute that they had on the road when they were talking about who would be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus said, those who desire to be the greatest, you must be the servant of all. That is our job. We are servants. We are not Kings. Now, we are all kings and priests in Christ because that, is, that speaks to our position in him, but not in our ability to lord over people because he says the Gentiles lorded over them. But it shall not be so among you. Those who desire to be greatest must be the servant of all. So our job is to serve. I have many people that come up to me and say, you know what, Pastor Jesse, you shouldn't be moving chairs. You know what? You shouldn't be doing this. Just do this. Just do this. You know what? I, I'll get my time in the Word, but let me serve you. Let me move the chairs. Let me help with the projector. Let me do those things. Let me keep myself in my proper position, lest I also fall like Saul did and begin to look at myself as something other than what I am and what God has created me to be. If I'm in there, just let me do it. I've got to stay right. And I want you to keep me in the right place. If I'm not scrubbing toilets, if I'm not helping with the chairs, if I'm not going over there and helping with the children, then you call me on it because I'm supposed to be an example, not a boss. I'm a leader. Amen. A boss cracks a whip and says, go. A leader takes the reins and says, come with me. Amen. And that is my desire. And don't let me be anything different. We have prescri prescribed too much authority to the leaders in church. Yeah, that's right. We have this doctrine going around, submit to authority, submit to authority, submit to authority, submit to authority. Yes, that is true, but man has a wonderful way of augmenting a truth and bringing it something into something that is perverted. Yeah, right. Yes, we submit to authority. Yes, you are supposed to obey those who rule over you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, obey those who rule over you as those who must keep an account of your soul and let them do so with joy. Yes, obey those who rule over you. Go ahead and turn there. I want, you to, I want you to see it for yourself. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We, we hear this preached all day long to ensure our obedience. Hebrews. Thirteen. Verse 17. It says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy 
and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So is there a truth behind submission to authority? Yes. The only way that we can prove our trust of God is that we submit to him in his obedience. And God has given us examples of that to submit to here on earth. As a child, I submitted to my parents as unto the Lord. I needed to obey my father. It didn't matter whether I understood it or not. But so long as he led me in the path of God, I obeyed him. I obeyed him. Those who the Lord put over me in my workplace when I was in banking, I submit to them. And I, and I do as the Lord asks. Did I, have, did I have a reason not to? Yes, but the Lord said, submit. Do what they ask. They're not asking you to do anything unbiblical. I'm asking you to serve them. So I did. Within the church, we submit to those whom God has put over us. Because in submitting to them, we prove our trust and submission to the Lord. But there is no absolute submission to man. There is not. For anyone to ask that you give absolute submission without accountability is for them to ask you to make them God. And for you to offer absolute submission without question is to make them God. Is to make them God. Now, Hebrews 13, 17 holds true. However, Go to Hebrews 13, 7. This is another thing that needs to happen. We got to preach the full gospel and stop cherry picking the scriptures we want to give. We got too many people cherry picking scriptures and trying to create their own religion rather than just preaching what the word says. Verse 7. Remember those who rule, rule over you. When he's talking, that word remember there, he's not talking just like, oh yeah, I remember so and so. He's saying, look to them, consider them, study them, test them. Those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow. So these are people that you are following in the faith. So consider them, considering the outcome of their conduct. Considering the outcome of their conduct. In other words, those whom you are following, take a look at their life and their conduct. Hold them to the test. If they do not measure up, then don't submit. My submission is to God. To submit to a man who is not submitting to the authority of God is to submit to the man and reject God. I submit to the Lord wholeheartedly, as should you. You only submit to any leadership I offer so long as my life lines up with a life that follows Christ. If I ever step out of that, don't listen to me. And that's not me saying that. That's what the Word says. That's what the Word says. That's what we have to do. Those people have no authority unless we give it to them. Now, we have to be prayerful and do everything according to the Scriptures. But these are the basic things. God wants to know you. He wants you to know him. It is not about a man. It is not about a a, a church, an organization. You can come here this week and go somewhere else next week. You're still a part of the body of Christ. We're part of the body. I don't mind. I don't don't have to have this many people in here, even though it's cool because y'all are some good looking people and it's fun to look out and see you guys and talk to you. I enjoy that. But if there were four people here, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. You can can go wherever you want, do whatever you want. But I just want you to go. When you go, have this in mind, that you you test the conduct of those people. And don't make them an idol in your life. Don't do that. We, we We have such a strong tendency to do that. And it's easy to do that because we want to see things. We want to believe in some, someone. We want to worship. But our worship belongs to God and God only. Amen. God and God only. Amen. Just, so you guys, just so you guys know, that order that, that has been established, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. That is something that we honor and we respect here. I am not someone who is just trying to operate in authority. 
but I am also someone who is under authority. I am under the authority of the elders here at the church, as the Lord instructs in his word. Also in terms of there being an apostolic anointing that oversees me. The apostle doesn't only, if you, if you thought of it like raising crops, the, the, the apostle is the one who goes into a field that is filled with rocks and weeds and clears everything out and pushes it. It's the hard labor, gets everything out of the way, clears it out. That's what the, 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 the role of the apostle is. It is a very difficult life. So that's what they do. Then he says there are prophets. The call of a prophet is to keep order within the church, to make th- sure things are straight. So that would be like the person who plows, and they plow straight lines to make sure that, you guys ever drive, driven by on the freeway, like if you go out in Oxnard and everything, and you see perfectly straight rows to plant in. That's what a prophet does. They make perfectly straight rows. They make sure everything is in line. They bring correction and order. You guys, when you, when you drive by those things, you have a picture, it's a guy running, and he's like going like this. Anybody ever do that when you drive by real fast? Maybe when you were a kid. Okay, there's like two or three people who did that. Okay. So maybe I'm a little crazy. So they have, they have the straight rows. The evangelist is the one who plants the seeds. They are the ones that share the gospel. And they're planting seeds and planting seeds and planting seeds and planting seeds. The pastor is the one who waters and nourishes those seeds and cares for them and makes sure that nothing comes in, drives away the birds of the air that would try and come and take those seeds out. They, care, they, they are there night and day guarding and protecting. And then when they spring up, the pastor brings teachers to help them mature and grow to the fullness of the fruit. This is the order that we seek to establish here. My brother Don is not only a, a pastor and my pastor, but he also has an apostolic anointing on him. He is, he is out plowing the fields right now in Hacienda Heights, laboring intensely to win that community for the Lord. And the Lord is blessing him. He has an apostolic call. Part of the apostles, uh, apostolic call is to check in. He just texted me this week. He's like, Jesse, I want to check in with you. See how you're doing. See how things are progressing. Make sure everything is in order. So he does that. He also operates as a, as a prophet. He has a prophetic gifting. So he, he helps bring order. That prophetic gifting is also uh, bestowed upon the elders of the church to help keep order to speak into my life prophetically, to make sure that I am on the straight and narrow, and God will give them the ability to look into my life, and whether I'm saying anything or not, say, Jesse, the Lord is saying this. You need to correct this, lest it come in and taint what the Lord is doing. And they have that right, and they have that rule, and they have that anointing in my life. We have evangelists, and really, that's many people here, to go out and to plant seeds throughout the community. And we're going to become more organized in how we do that. Y'all will be hearing about that soon. But the evangelist planting the seeds. As a pastor, I guard, protect, water, nurture. Those whom God has planted here in this place. And then the Lord is also raising up teachers here to help teach and mature. And that will be done through our life groups. So we have times during the week to get together and to pour into each other's lives and mature as as a family and then bear more fruit. So the Lord is ordaining that order to make sure that everything is done the way he would have it done. So I just share that with you guys so you know, and I want you to feel comfortable and trust that God is overseeing this place. Make sure that you keep me and anyone else that has been blessed with the privilege of being a servant to you in God's house, in that place. And I'm going to be very strong with you. Stay away from anyone who would lord over you. That is not the heart of Christ. It is not. We pray for them. We pray that the Lord would touch them. But we cannot submit ourselves to that, lest we be destroyed. Saul, he not only destroyed himself, But all those who clung to him and gave him that position, they fell also. And I know what y'all are thinking. My heart isn't to reference that of what you are thinking. (laughs) That is not my intent. However, however, let it serve as an example. This is the word. 
and I commit to preach only the word. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and water the crops with pesticides. The pure, pureness of the word is what I, is what I bring. And if I do anything else, let me know. But this must be our heart. Keep Jesus king. And me and every other under shepherd as just that, a servant. Amen. Turn in your Bibles real quickly to John chapter 10. I just want to read something to you. Start in verse 1. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. John chapter 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up by some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, says the Lord. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. Uh, the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Amen. Jesus is our one shepherd. He's the one who gave his life. He's the one who sacrificed everything, everything for you. And he is asking for those who don't know him to come. He's saying, you are my sheep. If you were born on this planet, it is because he purposed it. He saw something wrong on this planet, and decided to send you to help fix it. Amen. You are not an accident. Amen. You did not just show up on this planet because of the will of man, but because of the will of God. Amen. You are not the descendants of primordial slime that accidentally got hit by lightning and life just sprung up. <laughs> having no meaning, having no purpose, spending this entire life just trying to distract yourself from the inevitable fact that this flesh will die one day. No. I'll tell you the truth. You were born, planned, and purposed to exist on this planet. To have relationship with your father. Because he loves and love produces life. You are here on this earth to discover who he is. And to grow in relationship with him. So that when this life is over, you enter into eternal life forever with your family. This is his desire. 
That is why he gave his life. Because when we sin, we separate ourselves from our father. It's like when I was a kid, if I went and I broke my neighbor's window, guess what? I couldn't do anything about it. I'm a kid. I don't have any money. I don't have any substance to cover that. Who do they go to? They go to your parents. They go to my dad and say, pay for what your son has broken. And sin makes the same demand of us. It demanded that our father, the only one who had the substance to pay for it, pay for it. And he did so willingly. Now all things can be made new. The broken pieces of your life can be swept away, picked up, put back together, and made something beautiful. But we just have to put our life in the hands of the master. He's the only one who can do it. He's the only one. And he will answer those, those questions that we all have. Where did I come from? He has the answer. Why am I here? He'll teach you. What's right and what's wrong? He'll show you that. Where am I going when this ends? You'll know you go with him. Nothing else can answer those questions. Nothing else can answer them. Only the Lord can. And I guarantee you, you've been trying to find something that will. But I believe today your search is over. Today, if you will allow me, I would like to introduce you to your father, the one who created you, who loves you with all of his heart. And all you have to do to respond to that is say yes to him in your heart, because he's asking, will you believe in me? Will you trust in me? Will you please just believe that I love you so much and I've given everything I have just for you? And not only that, I have been plotting and scheming and planning to get you in this place your entire life so you could hear that I love you, if just for a moment. If that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to know him.